It was around this time last night that Kevin Matthews discovered his wife murdered in their Westlake's home. And I'm thinking to myself, something is not right about this. She egged him on and he finally snapped and did it. To see all those stab wounds, you realise what terror that lady went through trying to survive. Fears began to grow for Mrs McGlynn's safety when she failed to show up for a pre-book bus tour. One day she was there, the next day she'd gone. She had a habit of picking the elderly and the vulnerable to line her own pocket. The most disturbing news came when body parts were found across the road. The first thing they said to me was, boss, we've got bodies. It blew into the single biggest case in South Australian history. Australia's worst serial killers. It was one of a kind. Three men have been arrested over the multiple murders. They were psychopathic killers. Knives, handcuffs, rope and an electric shock device. You just can't imagine human beings could act in such a way. The pungent smell of decomposing meat. It has no equal. It is a landmark case of serial murder. It doesn't get any worse. And if it does, I don't want to see it. Not in my lifetime. Adelaide has had a very bad run of sex killings, kidnappings and disappearances. She'd been strangled and dumped. The body count in Australia's worst serial killing has risen to 10. South Australia has a new chilling chapter. Most have been mutilated, their legs and feet cut off. People could just disappear off the streets. Adelaide is the capital of South Australia, the only free settled state in a nation occupied by convicts. But decades of grim homicides have led some to describe it as Australia's murder capital. South Australia has had more than its fair share of very unusual or bizarre serial murders and they tend to be the ones that I think a lot of people focus on and Adelaide being sort of the murder capital of Australia has actually been talked about in the international media as well. Author Sean Fuster agrees that the myth is contradicted by the statistics, but he believes there is something to be said for Adelaide's strange reputation. What upsets me the most about the myth is not just that it's untrue, it's not just that it hurts families and victims even more, but that the truth is worse. Adelaide isn't the serial killer capital of the world. It's the bizarre crime capital of the world. We seem to draw the unusual, the sick, the deranged killers in Adelaide. And it's the quality, not so much the quantity, of the way they commission their murders and abductions. Some murders have circumstances which make them, in some way, even worse than others. Over the last half century, Adelaide has witnessed many cases that defy comprehension. In 1979, the city was shocked by the discovery of Darren Stevenson. High-profile lawyer being stripped down to his underwear and stuffed in a freezer. They'd searched the house and they couldn't get into a refrigerator because it was uh, frozen up. I said, well, break it open then, Jack. And that's where Darren was, deep frozen in the refrigerator. Horrified zoo officials discovered some 64 animals lay dead in their enclosures. There's blood everywhere. People just can't be allowed to get away with this sort of thing. Most had been stabbed, some had their necks broken, and this alligator was dragged from his enclosure and beaten to death with an iron bar. The shocking murder of Tracy Muzak rose from a dispute over a $70 debt. The 18-year-old was punched, kicked, burned, stabbed, tied to a tree and strangled. Evil arrived on Robert Whitwell's doorstep in the form of his own granddaughter, Brittany Dwyer. The 19-year-old looked at family photos with her popper before stabbing the 81-year-old. She then bizarrely did the dishes as she waited for him to die. Could this gruesome strand of killers trace its beginnings to the state's unique origins? What was deceptive about South Australia was that it represents a revolutionary change globally in terms of immigration. The whole idea for settling South Australia was with free settlers, not convicts. They wanted to recreate the ideal English province. The founders chose the southern reaches of Australia as the perfect place to build this ideal society. The next step was to find its people. 
the other element of it was choosing your migrants. So right through the length and breadth of Britain, there were agents out recruiting. What you had was a very carefully selected group of mostly young people. Sean Fuster believes those selected were a strange mixture of social minorities. Adelaide was opened up to two groups in particular, social progressives and religious dissenters. Social progressives were basically the people that wanted to try new things, wanted to explore morality and expand the bounds of what society accepted. At the same time, the religious dissenters were people like the Lutherans, who had been so persecuted by the predominant Christian faiths. That they needed to get away, find a place to start up for themselves. So look at what you've got there. You've got a permissive group that want to try anything and you've got a group that is so used to being prejudiced against that they're used to keeping their secrets to themselves. Merge that together. You have a promiscuous, progressive culture that is all about secrecy. And that informed the very DNA of Adelaide. Try anything once, just don't talk about it. And in the years since its founding, could this tangle of progressive ideals have given birth to a twisted subculture capable of spawning unusually gruesome acts. As the 20th century was coming to a close, the city of churches was rocked by a horrific discovery that didn't just contribute to the Adelaide murder myth, it sealed it in stone. It was a case that would see its caption rewritten in the new millennium as the city of corpses. The northern suburbs of Adelaide are the home of the city's underclass. You've got a lower socioeconomic bracket out that way. You have housing trust houses, you have people receiving assistance. Opportunities are limited for those who live there. Some get by with government handouts, some turn to crime, and some just move on elsewhere. It began as the smallest of missing person cases. 22-year-old Clinton Trezais was reported missing on October 26, 1995. Nobody of great note, not many friends, loner. Clinton Trezais had been on the books for some considerable time. We would conducted national searches, um, quite extensive investigations, but um, couldn't solve it. The young man had not been heard from for three years, but in this part of Adelaide, that wasn't unusual. There were a number of old cases that the missing persons staff, in their downtime, they could review those files and, um, where necessary, reinvestigate them. And when we had another look in Trezais, we found that he had an association um, uh, with another uh, person called uh, Lane. Barry Lane was an older man who had previously been convicted for pedophilia. He had formed a friendship with the much younger Trezai's years earlier. He was a good friend of Clinton says. They used to go out shopping together and, and that sort of thing. And, and he, Clint was uh, handsome, very nice lad. He seemed very straight, though. He didn't seem to be a homosexual. Sylvia Lane was also concerned that something strange was going on. He cried on my shoulder and said, Mum, I'm scared. If investigators had concerns that Barry Lane was somehow involved in Trezise's disappearance, they weren't able to discuss it with him because Barry Lane had also been reported missing. We saw that Lane was drawing down on a disability pension. So then we set up some surveillance where this disability pension was being withdrawn from, and that's where we first identify a person called Wagner. 27-year-old Robert Wagner was linked to Lane. In fact, the two men had previously been in a relationship. This connection suggested the department was onto something. It is a catalyst for similar investigations in relation to all of the missing persons cases to find out how many of those were receiving attention and were they, in fact, the persons who were withdrawing it. And we found on a number of occasions um, they weren't. Detectives discovered a similar situation occurring, not in Adelaide's northern suburbs, but almost 100 kilometers away at Murray Bridge. Suzanne Allen had gone missing in Adelaide two years earlier, but her social security account was still alive. 
with Susan Allen. We set up a similar surveillance uh, technique and we identified John Bunting as um, drawing on her pension. Before moving to Murray Bridge, former slaughterman John Bunting had been in a relationship with Suzanne Allen. He was also a known associate of Robert Wagner and Barry Lane. As the coincidences started piling up, yet another missing person report was filed. Police get a call. A woman's gone missing. What would have interested me if I were the officers taking that call is that it wasn't her husband that called in the missing persons report. It was someone else. By now, we were concerned that Elizabeth had met with foul play. Elizabeth Hayden had been reported missing by her brother in November 1998. The police found it surprising that Elizabeth's husband, Mark, hadn't filed a report. Suspicious, detectives took him in for questioning. Mark Hayden was interviewed in relation to the disappearance. Was he cooperative? He answered questions in relation to it, but the information that he gave was of very little assistance to us in discovering the whereabouts uh, of Elizabeth. Hayden was also known to be friends with John Bunting and Robert Wagner. Investigators' concerns were escalating. Of further interest to them, Hayden's four-wheel drive had also vanished immediately following his wife's disappearance. That vehicle disappeared at the same time that Elizabeth Hayden had disappeared. So it was important that we tried to locate that vehicle. By now, we were concerned that Elizabeth had met with foul play. South Australian police had linked four missing people. There seemed to be a tragic pattern developing. Investigators quickly added a fifth name to this list, Ray Davies, a mentally handicapped man who had lived in the backyard of Susan Allen's house. It was at that stage that we declared these missing persons a major crime. They now had enough information to get approval to tap the phones of Bunting, Wagner, and Hayden. Mate, this is the voice of happiness. Ah, uh, yeah, we're on our way up there. Cool, just walk right in. Yeah, the machine is still set up, is it? Yep. The phone taps provided another clue, Snowtown. We learned that Bunting and Wagner were in fact driving up to Snowtown. And that is the first time that Snowtown came into the investigation. The sleepy Wheatbelt village of Snowtown lies 250 kilometers north of Adelaide. Founded in the late 1800s, there was nothing to distinguish it from dozens of country towns dotting the South Australian mid-north. When they drove into Snowtown, that was the first time that we saw this four-wheel drive that we'd been looking for all over Australia. That was the key to the detectives going in and speaking to the people at that address. And that's when we were advised about the old disused Snowtown uh, bank. The disused office in the main street of Snowtown had recently been rented to Bunting. That took us over to the bank and the detectives were able to manipulate the vault with some wire. When they opened the door of the vault, the smell of death hit them. The first thing they said to me was, uh, boss, we've got bodies. In the vault, they found six barrels. Those six barrels contained the remains of eight people. That was the first time that we realised that um, uh, this was the evidence that we'd been seeking. What had started as a missing person search had ended in one of the most horrific crime scenes in South Australian history. Who were these people? Were they only people that we, we already knew about? Or in fact, were there other missing persons? When we finally identified the people, some of those people we didn't even know were missing and in fact had never been reported missing, perhaps because nobody cared. Along with the remains of Elizabeth Hayden and Barry Lane, six more victims were identified. Their final resting place? Grim barrels in a disused bank vault. The finding of the bodies was the additional evidence that we, uh, we needed. As the police arrested Bunting, Hayden and Wagner, the media swooped on the story. It was colossal. We had located the bodies and arrested the offenders before the media became aware of it. And that triggered 
an enormous media storm. I can vividly recall when the lid was lifted off the Snowtown the murders case. Police told the media uh, at a press conference the following morning. I think it was one of the biggest press conferences that I walked into with 40 or 50 journalists and media from all over Australia. This is certainly one of the most complex, uh, tragic and quite horrific matters that we've had to deal with. The story literally exploded. Eight dismembered bodies stuffed into barrels. Eight bodies were found in a disused bank vault at Snowtown. The disused bank where the decomposing bodies were found stored in six plastic drums. As far as a serial crime, this was the largest that we've had in Australia. Three men have been arrested over the multiple murders. So far, they've only been charged with one count. There's only one word to describe how big the bodies in the barrels case was. Monstrously big. But this was a global phenomenon. I had uh, a little over 500 calls from the media in the first week from all over the world. The disused bank vault at Snowtown housed most of the remains. Eight bodies were found stuffed into barrels, along with a disturbing collection of knives, handcuffs, rope, plastic gloves and an electric shock device. And it became the biggest serial murder investigation in, uh, in Australia's uh, modern history. Police continued their investigation, meticulously examining everything inside. Despite finding eight victims, the case was far from over. Police still hadn't found three of the original missing persons, Suzanne Allen, Ray Davies and the young Clinton Trezise. A highly skilled task force has been formed to further investigate what could be Australia's worst ever case of serial killings. Never before in the history of South Australia has the challenge been so great. This area of policing was um, in some ways uncharted water. Hundreds and hundreds of further inquiries and that allowed us to gain further evidence. Uh, there were multiple crime scenes that had to be examined forensically. Um, excavations had to be conducted at a number of premises for more remains. We started to appreciate the enormity of the task and the complexity of it, and you get one chance to do it right. The South Australian police quickly set up a task force. Meanwhile, the unrelenting media attention generated a tip-off from the public. We'd had a phone call through Crime Stoppers. This afternoon, police turned their attention to this backyard in Adelaide's north. The call basically said that uh, we think that you better go out to Waterloo Corner Road um, and uh, you'll find some bodies out there. The housing trust home was formally rented by John Bunting, one of the three men accused of the killings. And I started digging and down about a metre, we found in a number of um, plastic bags the remains of Susan Allen. Police investigating the bank vault mystery in South Australia have found more human remains in an Adelaide backyard. And down about three metres in an underground bunker that had been filled in, we found the remains of uh, Ray Davies. With ten bodies located so far, detectives are confident there's still one more murder victim yet to be found. Just where is the question? Tragically, that prediction was proved right when another killer appeared on the scene. Jamie Vlasakis, age 19, was the stepson of John Bunting, and he contacted police in the hope of striking a deal. It wasn't until Jamie made his disclosures and provided his statement that the full horror uh, of the events started to unfold. Vlasakis confessed that he had been involved in the last five murders, as well as revealing dates and locations he confirmed there were two more victims, including 19-year-old Clinton Trezise. Reported missing in 1995, Trezise had actually been bashed to death in John Bunting's living room in 1992. The death toll had now reached 12 people. It was the worst case of serial killing ever documented in Australia. Four men accused over South Australia's notorious Bodies in the Barrels murder case have appeared in an Adelaide court at the start of a committal hearing. I remember vividly the first day of the trial, standing out the front of the Supreme Court in Adelaide, watching the hordes of media descend from interstate and overseas. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. 
John Bunting, Mark Hayden and Robert Wagner have been charged with 10 murders. Their youngest recruit, 20-year-old James Lasarkas, faces five counts of murder. The court was told the men recorded the voices of their prey to make their families believe they were still alive. Hi, Mum. I've met a pretty girl. I'm on my way to Perth. Stay the f*** out of my life. They would get the victims to call uh, relatives and loved ones and say, basically, I'm leaving town, don't try to contact me, which was um, in instrumental in them continuing to get away with their crimes. As the trial continued, the enormity of the crime grew. Reporters were embedded in the courtroom, spending years covering this, because so much unremitting, unrelenting horror came out of each and every day of those hearings. The actual way in which the murders were committed was described chapter and verse to the jury so that they could understand the, uh, the brutality of the acts. Over 171 days, the country discovered that the victims were brutally tortured before being murdered. You just can't imagine that, that human beings could act in such a way. I was absolutely shocked. I mean, uh, there's not much that I haven't seen in my career as far as um, uh, you know, murder and mayhem, but uh, this was simply at another level. The court heard that Bunting and Wagner used an array of implements to brutalize their victims. An electric shock machine, cigarettes, garrots, pliers, and hammers. They even cooked and ate the flesh of one of their victims. What these victims endured uh, was just absolutely unimaginable. Most grueling of all, the victims' families were forced to hear about the agony their loved ones endured in their final hours. It's been a horrible experience, and the, the words, the things that were said in there, it's incredible to have listened to some of what went on with my son. The removing of body parts are defleshed. We're talking the bottom bestiality of mankind. The serial murderer is often portrayed uh, much like your Professor Moriarty character in your Sherlock Holmes, as this criminal mastermind who's always one step ahead of the police. The reality is actually vastly different to that. Serial murderers are mostly unremarkable people, but for their crimes. They aren't criminal masterminds. They very often get away with what they get away with simply because they're unbelievably lucky. And when people find out who they are, they're often surprised because this is the guy next door. But it seems there had been signs of a murderer in the making. Bunting set up what he called a spider wall, emblazoned with the names of suspected child molesters. John Bunting had a deep hatred of pedophiles and homosexuals, which had grown into a psychopathic will to kill. He always had a mean streak underneath his placid persona. He said, I want to go out and kill all the pedophiles and homosexuals. Bunting started to lump unrelated groups together as being effectively one and the same, where he's accused homosexuals as being just as bad or the same as a pedophile. And so he and his crew would target these individuals and they would eventually kill them. Ultimately, the majority of the victims were innocent people targeted only for their sexuality or because the killers simply didn't like them. But the sadistic torture suggests a more disturbing motive. If it goes on for hours, there's actual enjoyment from committing that torture against uh, those people at that point in time. They were psychopathic killers. Certainly, Bunting and Wagner appeared to get some pleasure out of inflicting pain. It was also that they seemed to escalate the level of violence towards the end as well, uh, which is, again, not dissimilar to, to what we see in other serial cases. We believe Bunting simply liked to kill, and he played very much a leadership role. As by all accounts, he was quite a charismatic person. He was able to bring people under his control fairly easily. He recruited other people to his cause. 
these people seem to spend a lot of time sitting there talking about all of the things that these other people in the community were doing. And in a way, it's actually very, very similar to what a lot of cults do. And what you do is you reinforce that doctrine of inside and outside. If you're inside, you're one of us, and if you're outside, then look out. At the end of South Australia's longest ever criminal trial, John Bunting and Robert Wagner were sentenced to life imprisonment with no chance of parole. Mark Hayden was convicted of assisting in seven of the murders. And Jamie Vlasakis pled guilty to four counts of murder, reducing his sentence by testifying against his friends. But Bunting and Wagner weren't the only ones to receive a life sentence. The small village of Snowtown has suffered from its association with the case. They have taken a real hit as being the place and the centre of these horrific murders, when in fact that wasn't the case. The true epicenter of these killings was the northern suburbs of Adelaide. But that's not the only part of the city where murder stalks its citizens. The family-friendly suburb of Westlakes is idyllic, which makes the savage knife slaying of a mother of three seem all the more horrific. It was around this time last night that Kevin Matthews discovered his wife murdered in their Westlakes home. Despite efforts by her children to resuscitate her, she died soon afterward. Three boys haven't got a mother. A lovely lady is deceased. If ever there was a senseless murder, this would be it. With large houses surrounded by water, the picture-perfect suburb of Westlakes is close to the city and only minutes from the Adelaide beaches. It appears to have everything going for it. No one could have foreseen the act of savagery that would rock the community to its core. It was around this time last night that Kevin Matthews rented three videos from the local store before returning home with his three sons to find Carolyn Matthews in the kitchen suffering multiple stab wounds. Despite efforts by her children to resuscitate her, she died soon afterward. While detectives aren't ruling out robbery, there's no evidence of a break-in. Carolyn Matthews had a small business making soft furnishings and was well known for her long-standing commitment to the local community, especially the Surf Life Saving Club. A woman that nobody spoke to a bad word about. She was a lovely lady by all accounts that everyone ever spoke to. The apparently random killing shocked Adelaide and the city sadly watched a family mourn for their wife and mother. More than 400 family and friends gathered for the funeral at Port Adelaide this afternoon. Her husband, Kevin, helped carry the coffin past an honour guard. But the question on the minds of all those present is why Carolyn Matthews, a devoted wife and mother of three, was so brutally murdered. Carolyn hadn't simply been murdered. She'd been savagely stabbed seven times with a kitchen knife. And I can remember being at the post-mortem and seeing all these stab wounds and thinking, you poor woman, her last 20 minutes of life must have been absolute hell. And then you think of her young sons giving her CPR to try and save their mum. And she's got all these multiple stab wounds. It's just terrible. But something about the case unsettled investigators from the beginning. I get down there and get told this story how Dad takes the boys down to the video shop, and then comes home and Mum's dead, and I'm thinking to myself, Something is not right about this. There's more to this than meets the eye. That 20 minute window of opportunity just was, was very doubtful, very odd. So straight away it sets the alarm bells off. On the floor in the kitchen there was a footprint in the blood on the floor. And you took one look at it and you could see it was a sole of a military style boot. This is going to be interesting, you know, find that sole. Detectives would later discover the owner of the boot print two weeks later a petty criminal named David Key. David Key got arrested on totally unrelated matters. I went out and saw him, and he's sitting on the floor of the cells, and I see he had military-style boots on. So I said, lift your feet up. And he lifted his feet up, and there were these soles. So we took his boots, took them to forensics, and they found Caroline Matthews' blood. Early this afternoon, police arrested a 26-year-old unemployed man from the northern suburbs and charged him with her murder. 
How do you explain having Carol and Matthew's blood on your boots and you don't live anywhere near them, you don't even know them? The truth about Key's involvement had begun unraveling just days after the murder, starting with a suspicion Carol and Matthews had had about her husband. Her friend Sharon Karma said in the weeks before her death, Carolyn would cry to her about her suspicions Kevin was having an affair. Kevin Matthews was in a sexual relationship with a woman by the name of Michelle Burgess. Michelle Burgess was married, but that hadn't stopped her from embarking on several relationships one of which was an all-consuming extramarital affair with Kevin Matthews. He started checking around various hotels and motels and seeing their names. Nine o'clock in the morning, they're meeting in a motel room and they're there till midday. We'd put to him a number of times about his affair with Michelle, his romantic involvement, and he'd just deny that all the time. And, you know, you'd think, Kevin, it's so blatantly obvious, you know, why can't he admit that having an affair doesn't mean you're a murderer? In most cases, that would be correct. But evidence had come to light that suggested the cheating couple wanted Carolyn out of the way. A woman came forward to say Michelle Burgess asking if she knew anybody that would kill somebody for money. The woman she knew, she asked that, and then the woman let us know. Investigators discovered Michelle had been in contact with David Key. With this connection established, Burgess was arrested, and the investigators were confronted with a strange and telling request. Most people screamed for a lawyer, not Michelle Burgess, I want my mum and dad. John Keane and I interviewed her for probably an hour and a half, two hours, in front of her mum and dad over a murder, and she had them wrapped around her little finger. They believed she was innocent. They thought we were horrible men for what we did. And then myself and another detective went down to uh, see Kevin uh, to say that she'd been arrested. And the next day he goes to court and supports her with his forever hat. That was bizarre. Kevin walks into the court, he's got a white sun hat on. It's got R&R &R forever and he's sitting in the court holding it and showing it to her. What it was, secret message between them, I've got no idea. Truly bizarre. Mr Matthews, can I just ask why you're in court today? No. Are you happy that the investigation is progressing the way it should be? She's innocent. It wasn't too long after that that Matthews himself was uh, arrested and charged with his wife's murder. In a sickening turn of events, the man who Adelaide watched farewell his wife had now been arrested for her murder. It was alleged the two lovers hired David Key to commit the murder so Burgess and Matthews could further their relationship and seize Carolyn's life insurance. I think it became fairly clear in the trial that Burgess was certainly the, the dominant partner it quickly became clear that Michelle Burgess's relationship with David Key was not just a killing contract. Michelle Burgess used sex as a tool to get what she wanted. She had sex with David Key on quite a number of occasions. I really don't think Key wanted to do what he did. But she egged him on and urged him on and he, he finally snapped and did it. And I think Kevin didn't want it to happen that way either. But he didn't have the balls to, to stop it because she just had the power to get these men to do what, whatever uh, she wanted them to do. Finally, as the trial was underway, David Key broke free of Burgess's spell. He pleaded guilty and confessed to his crime because he could see, unless I help myself, no one else is going to. I'm the pawn in the game and all the blame's going to be put on me. He received a 20-year sentence for murder and then he took to the witness stand and the terrifying truth came out. David Key gave a first-hand account of the events leading up to Carolyn Matthews' murder. It was alleged the two lovers hired David Key to commit the murder so Burgess and Matthews could further their relationship and seize Carolyn's life insurance. David Key says Michelle Burgess offered him a $25,000 contract to kill Carolyn Matthews. Michelle said I needed to do a real crime and make a name for myself. Kill someone, prove that you're not a sook. There was a $100,000 insurance policy on Carolyn's life, which Kevin and Michelle were going to use to pay David Key. Michelle Burgess and Key go to where Kevin was working and tell him, like, this is what's going to happen. The three of them were seen in a heated discussion. Michelle said it's got to happen tonight. 
That's when Kevin was arranged to pick up the boys. Matthews took his three boys at a pre-arranged time to the local video store. He knows that uh, David Key and Michelle are going to go into the house and confront Caroline. Caroline has come to the door and had an altercation there and she's been forced back into the kitchen. Michelle's just egged Key on to do it, to do it, to do it. He says, Burgess said, be a man, kill her. Show me that you love me. I lost the plot, grabbed Mrs. Matthews and started stabbing her while Burgess stood behind him laughing hysterically. I see all those stab wounds like that and the defence wounds on her hand where she was you know, trying to stop the knife and uh, having fingers and that almost cut off. You realise in what hell and terror that lady went through trying to survive. Kevin Matthews was convicted of murdering his wife. His lover, Michelle Burgess, was also convicted. I think they got 30 years. They should have got 130. And do you feel that justice now has been done with that sentence? I guess so, but I'd rather have my daughter back. And we've just got to go on for the boys now. The family have lost a daughter. Three boys haven't got a mother. A lovely lady is deceased. If ever there was a senseless murder, this would be it. Even more horrifying than Carolyn's pointless death was the revelation that her husband had allowed their children to return home in time to see their mother bleed out on the kitchen floor. How anybody could do that and call himself a man is, I got no idea. And that shows you what a cowardly, craven sort of an individual he was. I don't know how anyone could do that. Those boys are scarred for life. Kevin Matthews' appalling act was all driven by his shameful lust for another woman. When you see what Michelle did, what a piece of work. How can one person do that to another? She's pure evil, that Michelle. Michelle Burgess rose to infamy as one of the city's deadliest women. Almost 10 years later, a bizarre homicide saw yet another woman at the center of a murder trial. Her house destroyed in a million dollar fire and her husband Satish now dead, Regini Narian faced the Adelaide Magistrates Court. Regini was the long suffering wife of Satish Narayan. Mrs. Narian had poured metho on her husband's genitals while he was sleeping after discovering he'd been having an affair. She discovered that all of the money she was earning was going to another woman. And so she hits upon a plan. I'm going to burn a dot on his penis. Then when his lover sees that dot, she'll know he belongs to somebody else. The blaze destroyed their home and their neighbor's house. Mr. Narian died of his injuries in hospital three weeks after the fire. But Regina was never convicted of murder because all she'd wanted to do was burn a dot on his penis. In 2016, Leanne Prack murdered her housemate. She licked the blade of the bloodied knife. After that, she stabbed him seven more times the killer then allegedly sent a text message to a friend which read, SOS, he dead. But no woman has become more synonymous with murder than Angelica Guevara. Some murders have circumstances which make them, in some way, even worse than others. I felt this was one of the worst that could be imagined. Fears began to grow for Mrs McGlynn's safety when she failed to show up for a pre-book bus tour. One day she was there, the next day she'd gone. It is extremely out of character for her not to have told somebody where she's going or what she's doing. We are urgently seeking the public's assistance to try and locate her. Von McGlynn was a lovely old lady that lived in suburban Adelaide and was known as the European Wasp by her neighbours. Anytime there was a barbecue, Vaughn would turn up. She didn't have much family of her own, and so all her neighbours became her surrogate family. The neighbour of Von A. McGlynn had seen some missing tiles on Von A. McGlynn's roof. Tiles that led to a manhole cover in the passage of Von A. McGlynn's house. Just days after Vaughn's disappearance, police had an unusual suspect. Her name was Angelica Guevara, but what nobody really knew about Angelica was she was greedy. 
She'd already ripped off a couple of old people as a news agent where she worked, going around to their houses and taking their social security checks out of their mailboxes. Guevara, in truth, was a fraudster. She had a habit of picking the elderly and the vulnerable to line her own pocket. Guevara had come under police suspicion by presenting Yvonne McGlynn's bank card together with a forged power of attorney in an attempt to withdraw $2,000 from the deceased's account. When the police went to Guevara's house to question her, they found more than they expected. She had the deceased's passport, she had photographs of the deceased's family, her driver's license, and she even had a toaster oven, which she had taken from the house. Guevara had every excuse under the sun. Von Amiglin had gone away for a while. Why was I at the bank emptying her bank account? Well, she'd asked me to, because I do things for people like that. The young mother had an answer for every question. For several months, throughout hours of interrogation, Angelica Guevara succeeded in keeping whatever secrets she had hidden from police. She was the most manipulative interviewee that I have seen in many years of criminal law. She was skillful, she was flirting, while at the same time being confronted with evidence that damned her. But she had the strength to resist that, and she was able to do that for many, many hours. While Scavari gave nothing away, her house told a different story. And as soon as we went in, the first thing that struck us was the overpowering stench that was in the garage. Police officers who were experienced at finding dead bodies were positive that this stench was coming from a rotting body. A thorough search of the property revealed no other evidence of a body, so police expanded the perimeter, and a short stroll away from the house, they learned the shocking truth. The most disturbing news came when body parts of the dismembered victim were found across the road from Guevara's home. Police made the discovery during an initial inspection of Christie Creek. The 83-year-old disappeared in December last year. The grisly find had confirmed the worst fears of the South Australian police. The woman so loved by her neighbours had been brutally murdered, callously dismembered and dumped like rubbish. The investigators had the final piece of the puzzle. There was a lot of evidence that led us to bring murder charges against Cavare. You know who I am? You're yes. under arrest for the murder of Mordain McGlynn. Uh-huh. OK? So you have to come with us. Come around here. Do you wish to ring anybody at this point to tell them that you're under arrest? Uh, my sources. A mother of two has been remanded in custody over the murder of 84-year-old Von McGlynn. Angelica Guevara appeared in an Adelaide court yesterday. She was arrested after body parts were discovered 100 metres from her home. This is who did this? Police are seriously expecting us to believe that this good-looking suburban mother of two is a vicious dismemberment killer? What we couldn't see was underneath that. Greed and evil. As the trial unveiled the true horror of her actions, Gavari's behaviour was extraordinary. As part of their case, prosecutors laid hours of videotaped interview on a screen just above the witness box. Gavari was watching herself intently. When the Angelica on screen said something clever, the Angelica in court reacted favourably to it. And when the Angelica on the screen cracked a joke, the Angelica in the courtroom laughed. She was an audience of one. It is the prosecution's belief that Guevara entered the house through the roof, that she struck Von Amiglin over the head with a statue. The motive was simply greed. She wanted to obtain the house from Von Amiglin and sell it. Then she had to get rid of the body somehow. She put this poor old woman in the boot of her car. We think from there she went to her garage where she dismembered her. And this is perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the whole case. She put each piece of Von's body in a child's stroller, then put her daughter on top of the body piece, wheeled it down the creek and dumped the body part. Her child's body was covering the body parts of her victim. The evidence against Angelica Gavari was overwhelming. 
but it was the appearance of one extraordinary witness that underscored the bizarre nature of the crime. One of the most damning pieces of evidence was the testimony of Guevara's own mother. Through a Latvian interpreter, Mrs Dombrovska told the court she had a strained relationship with her eldest daughter and urged her to tell the truth about Mrs McGlynn's disappearance. She said her daughter eventually confessed to the murder when she confronted her at a Christmas Eve celebration. It's most unusual for a mother to be prepared to give evidence against a child. It must have been the most difficult decision she had ever had to make in her life. But it demonstrated to me a strength of character that one really sees in criminal law. The trial would go on to make South Australian legal history. The mother of two was sentenced to at least 32 years behind bars. It's the longest sentence ever handed to a woman in South Australia. The South Australian justice system had unraveled one of Adelaide's most depraved murders, proving once more that evil exists in the most unlikely places. South Australia has a new chilling chapter. They've knocked it to the ground and cut a throat. Pirio campaigned was stabbed 39 times. All murders by their nature are violent, but Kapunda was in another league. They don't deserve this. Ten-year-old Louise Bell disappeared without a trace. Don't hurt me. <laughs> Your children are exposing themselves to online predators. This was the first case of its kind in the world. Her death was brutal. Probably one of the worst things I've ever seen. A twice convicted child killer. It's absolutely horrifying. Her remains have never been found. I miss everything about her.